Uh, we're going to move on to Frank Tudor, who's the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Jamina. And Frank's going to talk to us about biomethane, which hopefully offers some kind of solution to our problems. Frank. Thank you. I'd also um, like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, um, their elders, uh, sorry, uh, past and present. Um, I wanted to touch on three things. Um, one, I wanted to make some comments which probably follow on from Marx around the GISU, the Gas Statement of Opportunity. Um, I think it's opportune to do that. I also wanted you to know how we think about the energy transformation and in particular the role of gas. And then I did want to touch, obviously, on the role that biomethane would play in the role of gas as we go forward. So where is the uh, buzzer? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for those, just a quick word of introduction. For those of uh, people who don't know us, we operate midstream gas and electricity infrastructure across the country. Uh, we own, we operate, and we have an uh, organisation which looks after the servicing and project delivery, which is called Zimfra as well. On the GSU, um, I think I want to make two points. One, um, it is a really good document. It does forecast into the future for the next 20 years uh, the supply, the demand uh, balance. On the supply side, it looks at the committed, the existing, the anticipated and the uncertain projects which could fulfil uh, the supply side. And on the demand side, it projects forward. Um, and the observation that you would make is that from about 26 onwards, on the assumption that everything is working, um, you start to see this emergence of a gap between supply and demand. I guess the observation that I would make is that historically we have had headroom. Supply has been in excess of demand by some considerable amount. Um, this indicates that that has been eroded over time which probably means, I'll choose my words carefully, that reliability is potentially affected, not only of gas, but of the entire system, which is now much more coupled. And as a consequence, we've got redundancy that we had previously that is not there. And so our ability to respond, not on averages, but to an event of the type that Mark described, where we have a coal-fired outage, we have some the Longford infrastructure is 50 years old, we have something that happens there, we'll, we have watering out of reservoirs or whatever it might be, and we need an injection of gas into the system which is in excess of what we can bring down from the north because even with the stage two developments that APA is talking about, that is limited. But if we find ourselves in that situation, uh, we have few choices to make. So that is one observation. The other observation is that um, AEMO also look at peak demand, and clearly from 23 on, onwards in the winter, it progressively gets worse. We have unserved demand occurring through the winter periods when we have those peaks. So I did want to make a comment because um, the project had slipped from being anticipated to being uncertain. I want to make a comment about the Port Kembla terminal. So my understanding is that Squadron have spent something like 250 million, or have committed to, uh, building the wharf facilities, and they will be completed at the end of the year. For our part, we're connecting that terminal to the Eastern Gas Pipeline, which gives us the ability uh, to inject both into the north and the south, into Sydney and into Melbourne, um, gas up to potentially 500 terajoules a day. Um, so that will be completed from a physical point of view come the end of the year, maybe into the beginning of next. Um, the issue will be the FSRU and when that arrives to make the terminal operational. And if you go by the averages, it's required in 26. If you go from a risk management point of view, I would suggest it's required much sooner than that. I just wanted to turn to how we think about the energy transformation. Australia's primary energy demand and consumption 6,000 petajoules, you can see that almost two-thirds of that is oil and coal. So it certainly is about decarbonising the electricity sector, which is a small component of that, but it's equally 
um, looking at the other sectors and what we need to do in agriculture, what we need to do in transportation. So this is a very broad-based transformation that we're about to enter into. Um, and where my head starts to spin is when I look at the electricity component only and I look at some of the forecasts that we've got, and the ISP is a good place to start. We talk about the installed capacity on the generation side going up from 70 gigawatts to 300 gigawatts. We talk about 10,000 kilometres of transmission being required. That's one component of it. They don't talk about the low voltage street by street upgrades that are going to be required as well. And we have some insight as to what that takes because we're involved in the ACT where, have they, where they have mandated for the removal of the gas distribution network by 2045. And we're facing into those issues and the electrification that's going to be required. And then the final piece is what happens behind the meter in terms of people having to migrate from gas to electricity. Um, this is an enormous undertaking and probably one where we don't have the people in the country, the capability, the capacity to actually undertake it. Um, and it does therefore raise, Whitney, you'll love this, our questions about scarcity. If we have so much capability and capacity, where do we focus that? And it also does raise questions about optionality and keeping options open, not closing them down, because the future is uncertain and there will be technological breakthroughs that we need to account for. If I think about the way that we now talk about the overall transformation, um, it's pretty clearly two-thirds of Australians will have distributed energy resources, some form, in their garage, on their roof by 2050. So it is very much a societal transformation. And that's an important point to note. I think the other thing that we note is the three things, security, safety and sustainability, are now givens. Um, if any one of those is compromised, um, we'll do anything that it takes to actually address them. We've seen that in Europe. So I probably won't go into those, but I think they're givens. The things that we now have got to optimise around are reliability. So the thing that I struggle with is there is an inherent resilience and reliability associated with two energy sources going e into each and every customer. We've got 10 million electricity, 6 million gas, so it's certainly the case for 60% of our customer base. If you remove one and focus on the other, uh, you need to be cognizant of what you need to do to build the reliability into that part of the system to actually hold the reliability that you need if you have a single source of energy going into a particular customer's uh, residence. The other thing is affordability. Um, and here we get lots of confusing messages. I think for me, everything that is involved with decarbonisation going forward includes, in the short term, additional cost. The benefits will be reaped over time, but we're not going to get a cost saving through it. So we've got different pathways that we can choose, and they are really important in terms of uh, how we think about affordability going into the future. And the other thing that's down the bottom is something that is coming into the play more and more, which is doability. And I think about doability in three ways. I think about the people, the resources, the capability that we need. Um, we have 1,300 transmission workers in the country. Um, some of those are close to retirement. We've got 10,000 kilometres of transmission built on the electricity side to, to put forward. Um, we need 10 times that. We need 10 times that. So doability is a significant issue. If you then think about a race with 80 countries, all about to start wanting to decarbonise in the next 20 to 30 years, they're all looking at the same supply points for things like nickel, cobalt and other things that we need, rare earths that we need for renewable energy. So there are going to be a lot of supply pinch points, there are going to be a lot of people that are disappointed. Again, it comes back to this issue of doability. And I was in Europe recently, and permitting, as they call it, social licence, as we might call it, is a significant issue. And we know about NIMBY, not in my backyard. They've coined something, and people may know this. Um, it, they call it banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Um, and they have got significant issues 
the number of projects that they've got in play. Of all places, Spain was a really classic the bar chart this big in terms of all the projects that they had in play and the projects that they were delivering. But permitting in an OECD country where everybody has a say is a significant issue to actually getting on with the energy transformation. And then I think the three outcomes that we do need to achieve, we need to have a just transformation. So there are people out there, two thirds of people are going to have distributed energy on the roofs. Um, some one third are not for different reasons. There will be people left behind. We don't want to leave people behind. Uh, in terms of the economic dislocation or opportunities for growth and jobs, we need to be cognizant of that. Mark talked about the retirement of coal in WA. Um, that's going to impact the town of Collie significantly. That's the kind of dislocation we're talking about. Where are the jobs created to take over from that? Really important. And the final piece, and I kind of struggle with this when I hear people say, we're going to have a choice. Everybody's going to be able to decide whether they have gas or electricity. Well, guess what? If you are sitting on a gas feeder where you are the last one, and four years ago there were a thousand customers, are you prepared to pay 1,000 times the price for the service of gas? I suspect not. So striking the balance between individual choice, what's good for the community and a national interest, is not an issue that we've even started to front into, but one that we can see as being very important going forward. Um, we call it the diehards. Gas is, if I think about reliability specifically, um, gas has got many attributes. Mark talked about some of them, the responsiveness, the ability to store it, the energy density, the availability, the access, all really important, and it plays a significant role across all those different areas. The one that I wanted to highlight, which comes back to resilience, I don't know if Adam Watson's in the room, but um, Adam, there you are. Um, Adam and I had the experience of uh, dealing with an outage on gas in Bathurst, Orbust, and uh, Lithgow in New South Wales, regional New South Wales. Um, and the one thing that I came away with, and it gets reinforced every time, you know, you can be in the dark and you can be cold and you don't want to be both. The people in Bathurst, you know, it's normally not the case because it's normally the LV network that gets pummeled by, by high winds. But in this case, we had a gas outage. But at least people had light. At least they had some access to warmth. But if you do away with both of those, you're in the dark and you're in the cold in the middle of winter, um, that is something that is really, really significant. So the reliability of our energy system, which we take for granted, needs to be well thought through as we continue the transformation. The other piece of work which I've quoted in the past is um, the work that Frontier Economics have done, which looked at um, full electrification through to 2050 and a hybrid model through to 2050. And what they concluded when they looked at those two and the cost comparison between them is that it was actually cheaper to deploy electrolyzers and generate hydrogen and put it into your gas distribution network than it was to do away with that and build all of that out in electricity infrastructure. Now, it requires certain assumptions around where hydrogen will get to, where electrolyzers will get to, being able to run the electrolyzers at high utilization during off-peak times, um, but that is certainly something that it really do, does need to be thought through. And it's a study that's been replicated in the EU with the same conclusions. The other one, um, this is what I call hard to migrate, and I guess it dawned when we had the recent uh, kind of newspaper clipping. Somebody said, we've got six million customers in the country. It roughly costs, depending on what your household looks like, 10,000 per customer to switch from gas to electricity. So we got that number of 60. 60, what was it, million, billion, um, being put into the newspapers around, you know, what it would actually take to convert, so the 60 billion number, what it would take to convert 6 million customers from gas to electricity. Um, and when I look at that number, I know that that was done on a typical residence. So it depends on how many, household, how many rooms you've got, how many members are in your household, and if you want to go for full ducting. So that number of 10,000 could be anywhere up to 40,000. And then you think about, okay, that's a detached sort of dwelling. And I know in Victoria that's 60% of the housing stock, residential stock. But what about Sydney? Have a look at the CBD of Sydney. Have a look at the intensity there. Do you think that number of 10,000 still holds? So if I could do anything at all to avoid doing a massive gas to electricity conversion in Sydney, 
that high intense area, I would absolutely be looking at it. Things that concern me there are the direct cost. The thing that concerns me there is the indirect cost, the disruption of looking at migrating from gas to electricity in what is it effectively a concrete jungle. You're doing live work alongside people living their normal lives. So when you look at the direct and the indirect cost, that's something that we need to very carefully factor in. Biogas, I want to turn to. Um, we have something like 200 odd plus biogas projects in the country, all relatively small. Um, about half are targeting waste uh, directly, the other half are targeting landfill. And of that landfill, about half, we're getting the gas and we're simply flaring it. So this gas is being, one way or another, naturally emitted into the atmosphere, but in the process of that, it's not doing any useful work. So the supposition here is that we should get it to do useful work before it gets into the atmosphere. And where they study this in Europe, um, they found that the replacement of natural gas by biomethane reduces the emissions in the distribution network by about 85%. And what we see there is the cycle. So, you know, organic waste subjected to a digestion process, process microorganisms, low oxygen environment, produces both CO2 and biomethane. The biomethane of the right quality goes straight in the pipeline. The CO2 can be combined with the hydrogen to make synthetic methane, which again find its way into the network. And then we've also got a digestate which comes out, which is nutrient rich, which can be used as a fertilizer. It is a picture of the circular economy. Um, lo and behold, waste is a universal problem or opportunity. Um, it is spread uh, across the globe and we find that many other countries, particularly in the US and Europe, are more advanced in their way of dealing with waste than we are. Um, in particular in Europe, there's something like 20,000 biogas projects. Half are in Germany. And remember, Germany is also sponsoring wind, it's sponsoring solar, it's sponsoring biogas. Um, and this has been brought around by regulatory support. And the most recent response to the invasion of Ukraine and uh, what the EU has done in its repower EU is set some, set some pretty aggressive targets. So by 2030, um, they're expecting 1,500 petajoules from biogas. By 2050, it's 6,500 petajoules. We, primary energy for us today is 6,000. And that's about, at that time, 62% of the consumption of European gas. So there's significant effort going in. And what is really important to note is that it's being supported by government policy regulation across the supply chain. So whether it's feed-in tariffs, whether it's contracts for difference, on the waste side, whether it's actually quality sorting, um, on the landfill side, whether it's levies on landfill, um, across the entire chain, um, support is being provided for the development of the industry. In Australia, Bioenergy looked and said that we've got something like 2,600 petajoules, big number, it's 40%. Um, I, I'm not sure about that, but it's, let's, let's take it uh, for what it is. We've certainly done some work where our gas distribution business is in New South Wales. We've done it with GHD. We've looked much more selectively. We've been heavily, heavily scrutinising, um, you know, the quality of the waste, its proximity to the pipeline, and we've come up with a number that we're comfortable with, which is about 34 petajoules per annum, and that's actually about the number that we distribute to one and a half million customers in Sydney. That equals our residential consumption in Sydney. So it's not an insignificant amount. Just in the last couple of days, um, it's been in construction for some time, but we're commissioning the Malabar project. It's taking wastewater, um, it's putting it into biogas, it's cleaning it up into biomethane, we're putting it into the grid. Um, it's about 100 terajoules per annum, um, which supplies about 6,000 customers. That could be scaled up to 12,000 customers and maybe 200 terajoules per annum. 
We work, it's a demonstration project, and so we're working with a number of partners. ARENA have provided half the funding. Sydney Water, uh, who were previously taking biogas and generating electricity, uh, rethought what they would do and worked with us to actually go through this process. Origin have recently committed to buying the renewable gas, verified by Green Power as renewable gas. Um, so we have a number of parties that have come together. Um, and what's really important, bearing in mind that 34 petajoules per annum, is that this is a demonstration project. We're thankful for the support that we've got through government and arena for the development of this project. We have now line of sight, staircase of projects, if you will, that get us close to 34 petajoules per annum. And what we really need is not project by project support, but support for the industry to actually incubate and take off. The technology is well proven. We've demonstrated it in Australia and the potential is there. So as we look forward, um, we see natural gas continuing to play a role, uh, perhaps being prioritised for those more important areas. We see biogas developing, ultimately it's going to be limited by the potential of waste. And then we see hydrogen in due course being commingled but starting later and potentially without any kind of cap in terms of the volumes that we may talk about, especially if we think about ourselves as a clean exporter of hydrogen and other fuels. So the request that we have is that um, we need to support this industry because of its importance, the optionality that it provides for us. Uh, we do need a renewable gas target. The renewable gas target could be anywhere between 10 to 20 per cent. We want it to be neutral, agnostic in terms of whether it's hydrogen or biogas. It just needs to be ver verified and validated as renewable gas. Um, and the one thing that we would then say is that if we can repurpose gas infrastructure through renewable gas, and you come back to, if you like, the energy transformation conundrum. It certainly helps us deal with reliability. It certainly helps with doability. Um, and it certainly helps, we believe, with affordability. Frank said he is willing to take some questions, um, if we have any questions from the audience. I never thought a gas crowd would be this shy. <laughs> but not normally this shy. There's a question. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Frank. You mentioned 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines, I think. I, I, I've heard lots of different numbers, can be bigger, can be larger. I guess the benefit of uh, the gas infrastructure, it's existing, it's below ground. How much resistance is there from communities to this, these 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines being planned? Well, I think if you take Osnet's example, you know, where people don't literally want it in their backyard, so they want it undergrounded, they want it removed. So I think the ability to work with, you know, yeah, what is a myriad, depending on the length of the transmission line, stakeholders, landholders, becomes problematic in countries like ours where everybody has a say. Um, but, you know, I think you're right, 10,000 is probably a modest number. It's probably, you know, significantly more than that. And certainly we've seen some work that has been produced by NAUS recently to look at, you know, how many people do we need in the country to deliver on this energy transformation. And when they put an export component in, it goes up significantly more than that. So this is not unique to, to, to Australia. It's, a, as I said, through the permitting issue that uh, the Europeans have coined, it is a common problem in OECD countries. And if we're going to actually deliver on the transformation in this 30-year time period, uh, we need to be able to deal with this in a much better manner. So it is an issue. Yeah, hi, it's Mark Wiseman here from Macquarie Capital. Thanks for the presentation. I just had two questions on the Northern Territory. Uh, firstly, there were periods where the NGP was not flowing because of Bonaparte issues. Could you maybe just talk through what's the latest news there? And then secondly, with the Beedaloo 
how enthused are you to, to continue to invest in more takeaway capacity, whether that be an NGP expansion or a, a new line? Um, both good questions. I think um, the, you know, the NGB has been up and down just recently and it's down at the moment. Um, I think this is all publicly available information, but you know, the issue is the supply side issues with Blacktip and E&I. They're currently moving through a drilling program. I think uh, this is again all public. They're drilling a third well. The third well should be flowing sometime in the next month or so. Uh, we're expecting that that will restore production levels back and we should get something close to normal operations. Um, there's obviously contingencies and risks around that that we all need to face into and manage. In terms of the Beetaloo, um, I think the drilling results continue to be very positive and certainly from where we sit, we always saw the NGP as being a connecting piece of infrastructure through to the East Coast and probably needs to be augmented and expanded uh, beyond that as the sort of Beetaloo uh, develops. But Beetaloo is an enormous resource, enormous undertaking required. So I expect, you know, in the next so many years we should get up to, you know, whatever the sort of medium term outlook might be, 100 terajoules a day, 200 terajoules a day. And then I think the prospect of getting that uh, experience to actually then build, to tap into the entire resource and you know, scary numbers are talked about and people talk about 100 to 500 TCF being involved so that they can support you know, enormous production levels if that turns out to be the case and the infrastructure requirements with that uh, will, uh, will obviously need to be put together but you know, there'll be such that I suspect partnerships are going to be a critical part of delivering on that. Thank you. Any further questions? We have one at the back. Hi, Frank. Thanks for your, um, your, your presentation. I found it really interesting. Um, name's Deborah Marsh. I had a question regarding biomethane potential. You mentioned 34 petajoules um, just from Gemini's own um, you know, facilities and projects you're involved with. If you were able to inject that into the networks, what, what would be the timing of that? Is, that? is that potential that's available in the short term? or? Um, it's a little bit chicken and egg. At the moment, we've done one demonstration project. There's been a whole lot of biogas projects, none of them actually gone to biomethane. So this Malabar project is the first one that's gone to biomethane, and biomethane basically is, you know, pipeline quality methane that we're injecting into the grid. Um, it's important as a demonstration project. Um, really, we need to work now collaboratively with government, federal, New South Wales government. I think we need to see renewable gas targets put in place. Um, and this, these projects are relatively small compared to what we normally sort of associate with supply side uh, projects in the gas industry. Um, and they are very complicated because you go from, you know, gathering waste, sorting waste, all the way through uh, the different elements of the supply chain and then to delivery into the, into the grid. Um, so it will be, it's not going to solve any immediate problems, but we're looking upon this as 5, 10, 15, 20 year um, solutions. So when we, you know, and I've put down a number which is anywhere between 10 to 20 percent, uh, you know, with hydrogen and biogas, you know, by 2030, uh, we think that's an aggressive target, but potentially a doable target and would really demonstrate that, uh, you know, the industry um, can play a very significant role going forward. Thank you very much, Frank.